Welcome and thank you for joining us today at Kempo Pentecostal Church Online. Today is week two of Advent. Our focus will be on peace, the peace that Jesus wants to bring into our hearts and lives, peace into all of our circumstances. At the end of our service today, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper, our communion time, as we give thanks to Jesus for all that he's done for us. If you don't have your emblems, the juice and the bread ready, let me encourage you to take a moment right now and go get them and be prepared. In our in-person service, as well as having communion, at the front of the church, we have two round tables set up on each side, which people will come forward to and stand on one side, and then someone on the other side of the round table, six feet away, will pray for them. Obviously, we can't do that online. But if you would like prayer, would you just type in your prayer request in the chat room right beside the YouTube, and someone will pray with you, or call or text me at 613-851-5779, and I will get back to you later on and pray with you, or send me an email at kohls.s.m at gmail.com. Those numbers and email will be on the screen at the end of the service as well. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this precious time of year. Lord, thank you that we can focus in upon peace. We can pray peace. We pray peace for the world. We pray peace for our community. We pray peace for our families and the individuals today that are watching. Lord, we know there are some individuals in our community and yes, in our church family who are sick, waiting on tests, Lord, I just pray that you would be round about them today. We ask for healing and strengthening because, Lord, we believe that you are the great physician. So minister to them right now, we pray. Lord, we also take a moment to pray for our leaders at every level of government that you would be round about them. Help them to understand it's not wrong to say that they don't have all the answers. It's not wrong to say that they need help. And in seeking help, may they recognize their need of your help and your wisdom as well, I pray. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for the many needs that are represented. The pandemics on several areas that are just hurting so many people. But Lord, we also pray for a nation that seems to have strained so far from our foundations. We would just pray that once again in Canada, that we would have a spiritual awakening to you, the true and the living God, we pray. Lord, we also pray for our health care workers. Lord, we understand that many are getting tired and weary and discouraged. Lord, would you strengthen them, body, soul, mind, and spirit this morning, we pray. We pray for our teachers. Encourage them. Give them the key to every student they teach to help them to understand and to learn and to grow, we pray. We pray for our students, whether it's in preschool, primary school, high school, or college, that you would be round about them today. We just commit them to you. Be with their teachers, help them, protect them. Be with their parents, many who are worried and concerned about their children's future. Give them a calm and a sense of your peace and presence today. Again, we love you, and we're just believing you for great and mighty things in this service. We pray. Amen. Traditionally at Advent, you don't sing a lot of Christmas carols until closer to Christmas. But I love Christmas carols, and this time is so short. This morning, we're going to sing two Christmas carols. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Then we're going to sing, it's not a Christmas carol, but a, carol, but a great declaration. It is... Who you say I am, I am who you say I am. Then after we light the Advent wreath while shepherds watch their flocks by night. Join in and worship with everything you have this morning. Reconciled, joyful. 
cross, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me, who the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed, I'm a child. a slave to sin, Jesus died for me, yes he died for me, who the sun sets free, who is free indeed, I'm a child. This morning, our Advent reading comes from Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 11, where it reads, He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. How much do you know about sheep? You're probably already guessing that I don't know very much about sheep at all. And some of the boys and girls listening this morning may know even more than I do, for sure. Uh, but I have heard some things about sheep. So let me tell you what I've heard. Uh, sheep are pretty much helpless and they can't find their own food and water. They need someone to take them there. They often wander away from the flock and become lost. Sheep have no means of protecting themselves and they'll run when they're threatened by a coyote, a wolf, or some other animal that tries to harm them. Wow, it sure sounds like sheep need someone to take care of them. And that's where the shepherd comes in. 
The shepherd is really important in the care and protection of sheep, of his sheep. There are many times in our Bible that God refers to us, his children, as sheep and the Lord as our shepherd. And this is a really great picture for us. Um, what does the shepherd do for his sheep? Well, let's think about it. He provides them with a pasture where they find food and he leads them to it. He takes care of those who need him most, especially those little lambs. And when they're hurt or afraid, he picks them up and he carries them in his arms. He gathers the sheep when they wander off and he protects them from their enemies. You know, the prophet Isaiah tells us how God's love uh, and loves and protects his children, how he protects us, how he protects you and how he protects me because we're his children. Listen again to what he says in Isaiah 40 verse 11. In the New Living Translation, he says, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep to their young. The shepherd always wants what's best for his sheep. He leads them into green pastures where they have plenty to eat. He leads them to water so they have plenty to drink. He leads them to the shelter where they'll be safe from any danger. Just as the prophet Isaiah said, the Lord is our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He provides us with all that we will ever need. And when we stray, he brings us back. And when we're in danger, he protects us from harm. And when we fall down, he picks us up. You know, Advent is a special time of year to make sure that we are close to the Good Shepherd, not straying off and doing our own thing, but close to him. Well, why would we want that? Well, why wouldn't we is what I would ask, but we want to be close to the Shepherd because when we're close to the Good Shepherd, we will know his peace and it won't matter what we're going through we'll have his peace and he'll go through things with us. And the second reason is because we'll be ready for his coming. How do we do that? How do we stay close to our good shepherd, Jesus? Well, it's really kind of easy. It's just like having a best friend. We talk to him, we share life with him. We let him get to know us, although he already knows all about us but we share those things with him and we get to know him better by reading his word and spending time with him as much time as we can. Join me as we pray this morning before we light the second Advent calendar candle. Heavenly Father, you are a good shepherd and we are your sheep. And sometimes we do wander or we get distracted as sheep do but we thank you for how you know and love us and care for us the way you do. This Advent season, may we love you the way that you desire us to love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, as we light the second candle of Advent, the candle of peace, it's our prayer that whether you're young or old, you will know the peace that only Jesus brings.
We now continue to focus in on finding, discovering peace in our struggles. Christmas is a big deal in many places around the world, and in Finland, that's no exception. They have a tradition that they have repeated for over 700 years every year. In the city, the people gather Christmas Eve around noon to hear the Christmas Peace Declaration. The proclamation is read from a balcony overlooking the city square from a mansion where a city official reads the following. This is the translation into English. The declaration is read out loud to remind people that Christmas has begun, to advise people to spend the festive period in harmony, to threaten offenders with harsh punishments, and to wish all a Merry Christmas. Tomorrow, God willing, is a graceful celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, and thus it is declared a peaceful Christmas time to all, by advising devotion and to behave otherwise quietly and peacefully, because he who breaks this peace and violates the peace of Christmas by any illegal or improper manner shall under aggravating circumstances be guilty and punished according to what the law and the statutes prescribe for each and every offense separately. Finally, a joyous festive is wished to all the inhabitants of the city. You better not mess with the Finns Christmas peace or you will be dealt with harshly. But what a great way to usher in Christmas with a reminder that Christ's coming and the peace he brings into the world. If you've been journeying with us last week, we continue on week two of Advent. You know what Advent means. It means coming or arrival. It's a season marked by expectation, waiting, anticipation, and longing. Advent is not just the extension of Christmas. It's a season that links the past, the present, and the future. Advent offers us the opportunity to share in the ancient longing for the coming of the Messiah, to celebrate his birth, and to be alert for his second coming. Yes, you heard me correctly, to be alert, watching for his second coming. Advent looks back in celebration at the hope fulfilled in Jesus coming the first time, while at the same time looking forward in hope and eager anticipation to the coming of Christ's kingdom when he returns for his people one more time. During Advent, we wait for both. It's an active, assured, hopeful waiting. Each week, we will focus on a different attribute of God represented in the coming of Jesus. Hope, peace, joy, and love. Each of these traits leads us to rediscover what Christmas is all about. And we're glad that you're here today, ready to rediscover peace. Today, we look at the shepherd's peace. We're looking at different characters of the biblical Christmas story and see how they encountered Jesus when he came to this earth. When we think of peace embodied in Christmas story, we can't help but think of the shepherds. They were unlikely recipients of the good news, God's message of peace. Harmony comes to read to us Luke's account about them. It's such a beautiful, almost poetic account of scripture. Maybe that's especially true for us who grew up watching Linus recited on Charlie Brown Christmas when he tells Charlie Brown, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. It's a great moment in TV history, but long before TV was imagined, it was a beautiful, inspired writing by Luke. Listen as Harmony reads it now. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. 
more. Um, this will be the side too. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, heaven on earth, peace to those who this is favor best. When the angels had left them and gone um, into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had, what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed, and what the shepherds said to them, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Thank you, Harmony. Wow. What an announcement that Luke recorded. This is like God's birth announcement of the birth of Jesus to the world. And what a way to announce a long-awaited event that happened in such a sudden, unexpected way. Suddenly, all of a sudden, in front of the shepherds, all unlikely people in the middle of a dark, long night watch looking after the sheep in the Bethlehem country. And then the sky is full of angels. The New Living Translation calls them the armies of heaven. And it's hard to imagine just how magnificent and bright and terrifying and glorious this must have been. And then there's a the sound. All together, these incredible angels are praising God, probably singing, declaring glory to God in heaven and a peace on earth to all men. What language or languages were they speaking and singing? What kind of melody and harmony? How loud it must have been. Or could anyone else hear it? Of course, the audience of this grand announcement, an amazing angelic show, must have been the most important VIPs and famous and powerful kings and queens, movers and shakers from the world, right? No. You know the story. It's those shepherds. These completely average Joe night shift working animal tenders who are the unlikely, unexpected recipients of this message of peace, wholeness, and God's favor. And yet it's another scene in how God is perfectly flipping the script on what humans would expect and plan and to do because he was giving us the plan to save the world. But the whole experience certainly leaves us asking, why shepherds? Why these completely unexpected, unassuming guys? Maybe it's because the shepherds actually tie the biblical threads together. First, the shepherds remind us of the patriarchs of Israel who were shepherds and nomadic animal tenders, roaming ranchers of the ancient world. Abraham was the original recipient of God's covenant that he would bless all nations of the world. And this promise was carried on through Abraham's, an uh, <clears throat> Abraham's ancestors, Isaac, Jacob, and beyond to David, Israel's greatest king. And wasn't he a shepherd after all? But the shepherds were everyday people, like you and I. They were nothing special. They had no entitlement, no pride or arrogance, no religious boasting. They fit right into this process, perfectly, of introducing the Messiah, a humble carpenter, and a peasant girl as parents of the Son of God, a birth in a lowly stable, surrounded by animals, rough and rugged shepherds out in the field, on the edge of the more refined civilization. 
They were the have-nots. Examples of God using and rising the humble and turning the world as we know it on its head. Those considered by society to be the most holy weren't given a place in the stable to kneel on holy ground and witness the arrival of the Messiah. These shepherds also signified Jesus' future ministry and teaching. Sheep might have been lowly animals, but they were special animals in Jewish culture. The Passover lamb was the sacrifice of the ancient Jew would make during the most important holiday of the year. Its blood was the atonement for a person's sin. The cost that had to be paid to restore a person to their place with God. And each time it was done, the sacrifice was a reminder of the original Passover and God's rescue and exodus of his people from Egypt. You and I know that Jesus was entering our world to fulfill his identity as the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. He was the ultimate sacrifice and payment for our sins. His death did away for the need of the sacrificial lambs each year. He came, his resurrection made it possible for us to be fully restored in our relationship with God. His life made it possible to experience true peace. Shalom in the Hebrew language and culture. The word and concept that encapsulates the completeness and the wholeness of God's original creation. It's probably part of these reasons that God sent the angelic messengers to announce the birth of Jesus, his son, to the shepherds. It certainly reminds us that God's favor is not based on human standards. His favor is on all, all those who humbly acknowledge their brokenness, would reach out to God and accept the gifts of hope, peace, joy, and love that Jesus came to bring and continues to give us today. Peace is not based on a class or position or occupation, but on God's purpose and designed to bring good news that will cause great joy to all people. I think the shepherds also lead us into several insights about our own intersection, our own meeting with God's peace still today. I want you to know that peace comes in the midst of our storms. Have you ever experienced a hurricane? I've only experienced a hurricane live while watching TV. It's an eerie feeling, especially as the eye of the storm goes through. You see it on the radar screen. It's the center of a circling whirlwind. But then all of a sudden there's a true stillness right in the center of the melee. The winds calm, the rain cease. It's a pause before the storm. It's only temporary, it doesn't last, and then those winds start howling again, this time in the opposite direction. It's kind of like those freeze frame moments in a movie when everything slows down to one tiny pinprick moment of reality where life or chaos or catastrophe happens all around the character. It's like life in a millisecond of clarity or pause. Let me ask you, how is your Christmas season going? How does your Christmas season typically go? If we're honest, we might choose words like busy, hectic, frantic to describe our lives this time of year, or maybe all year round. Maybe it's an overloaded schedule that robs you of peace, or maybe it's something more, relational conflict, pressures at work, a lost job, illness, you name it, we have plenty of options to choose from this year. For many of us, peace sounds like a way off, a good idea, a nice thought for the holidays, something that we long for. If this is where you find yourself today, let me encourage you that Jesus shows up when the storms of life 
threaten our peace, our hope, and our joy. He is there with us when love seems lost and far away and is totally unclear. But this is where and when God appears. This is where the Christ child is born. This is where the angels show up in the middle of Israel's dark night of Roman oppression and centuries of suffering and wandering. Where is God in the middle of a world turned upside down by a young Jewish couple who have found themselves at the center of cosmic events while at the same time trying to navigate on earth to the normal life realities of paying their dues by traveling by foot across the country to be counted by the government in the census. And having to experience childbirth for the first time far away from home without the support and care of the women and midwives that would have guided Mary back in Nazareth. Not only with the joys and wonders and fears, responsibility, having the first son, but God's son. New parents out there know what I mean? We think it's hard becoming new parents now. But what about Mary and Joseph? In all these circumstances, in all these struggles, this is where God showed up. And this is where God continues to show up for us in our pain, in our fears, in our confusion, in our grief, in our loss, in our uncertainty. I don't know every hardship you are facing today or every wince of pain that you are feeling, but God does. He is there bringing peace or calm to your heart, peace that defies your circumstances. These last two weeks, in the extended family, in my son and my daughter, and then in my brother and his wife, they each lost friends, connections in their lives. Tragically, a missionary over in Africa, a young boy in Canada, And as we prayed, hearing of the situations while they hung on to life, many people prayed around the world. And yet God in his wisdom and sovereignty decided to take both of them. And though I did not know these two individuals personally, because of my connection, I was drawn and as I read the first one, a husband on Facebook sharing that God had called his wife home. A week later, as I read on Facebook, a dad sharing the loss of his son. Yet in each of these two circumstances, a missionary and a pastor, as they shared their grief and their pain, there was that sense that God was with them. There was that sense of faith anchoring them. They both expressed the hope that one day they would see their loved ones again. They didn't use the words, but in their announcements, there was a sense of his presence and the peace that only Jesus brings. Jesus comes to us to bring peace in the midst of our storms. And perhaps you're shaking your head and say, how can that be possible? The peace that Jesus brings defies our circumstances. You know, in the biblical account of Luke, it says, that's great joy that the message brought. And maybe you are tempted to say, that's great for you to say there's great joy, there's great peace. You might be thinking that sound nice, but you may say, but you don't know my circumstances, Steve. You don't know how much it hurts. And no, I'm sorry, I don't. I can only imagine how awful it must be for some of you in the circumstances 
that you are going through. I can only agree on how unfair it probably is. But let me encourage you that there is a peace that is deeper. There is a peace that defies the circumstances, whatever you might be walking through today. No, in the face of all your feeling and all you're gone through, God's peace doesn't make sense, but it's real and it's there for you. It's healing. It can guard your heart from the continual wounds that might come your way. It can protect your mind from anxiety and fear. So whoever it is, whatever it is, oppression, unexpected, others' expectations of us, hopelessness and hurt, it's not fair. It may be racism, illness, aging, whatever it might be. All these things were back there in the original story. The people were oppressed by the Roman government. This came unexpectedly. Other people had other expectations, how the Messiah was to come. There was a lot of hopelessness and hurts. People having to travel for the census across the country. A lot of people were saying it's not fair. Maybe Mary and Joseph felt it wasn't fair that they had to leave their hometown where they were living in Nazareth and go back to Bethlehem and talk about racism that was so obvious in the times of Jesus. Illness, aging, and we face all those same kind of things today, and yet God desires, Jesus wants to bring peace. The Apostle Paul describes the process like this. From Philippians 4, chapter 4, verses 4 to 7, and we read these and studied these only a few short weeks ago. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation, your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let me encourage all of us today, no matter what we are facing, what we are going through, that this process begins that we will automatically turn towards God. Bring our hurts, our questions to him. Bringing our doubts and whys to Jesus. As Paul says, in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Sometimes we just want to question. We just want to have our own pity party. Sometimes we allow the doubts to come in like a roll and leave God out of it. No, we are to come to God. I don't pretend to fully understand the power in prayer, but I know it works. It brings a transformation in gratitude. It's not the power of getting what we have or conveying to God and trying to convince him that he needs to answer our prayers. We can try. He will listen. But it's much more than that. The power of prayer happens in this experience of peace. As our perspective changes, as we have an understanding that God is at work and that God is with us no matter what the circumstances, an acknowledgement acceptance that he's got this, that he can be trusted. Jesus is enough. And understanding Jesus is enough begins to bring peace within our hearts. The last thing I want to remind us of today is that peace is a person. It all comes back to a person. Peace is a person. Peace is Jesus. The scripture says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14, for he himself is our peace. And long before the arrival on earth, the prophet Isaiah called Jesus the Prince of Peace. Chapter 9 verses 6 to 7 read, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the greatness of his government and peace, 
there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. There are political tones to this message. And you can see why the Jews who wanted their political freedom and independence were eager, eager to look and accept Jesus as a king, as the Messiah. And more importantly, their tones of the completion of Christ's work and the eventual establishment of God's kingdom. But most of all, that child that is born, the son that is given, brings the power and the rule of peace into our hearts and our lives as we would invite him in. He is the bringer of peace between us and God. He is the bridge. He is the sacrificial lamb. He is the giver of life. He is the embodiment of shalom, God's peace, the wholeness that we need in our hearts and our lives as we enjoy a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus is the God who came to be with us, Emmanuel. And he offers us this invitation in this Advent season. And always, it's there for us. Matthew quotes Jesus in chapter 11. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is that not an offer of peace? May those words wash over us afresh today. And in the second week of Advent, let me encourage you to look at the Prince of Peace. Even when the wind blows in your face and the storms swirl, let me encourage all of us to come and worship like the shepherds. May we take Jesus at his word when the storm comes and surrounds us. When he said, come on to me, all you who are weary, that we would come to him afresh. Let me remind each of us to come to him because he is still here for us. The invitation is there. The Prince of Peace is still with us today. Father, we pause for a moment. And we just pray in these next few moments that you would prepare our hearts to celebrate out of love and obedience the Lord's Supper, the communion time. I pray for those who heard God speaking into their lives and realize that they are far away from you. They haven't invited you. They haven't recognized you to be their Lord and Savior. And yet in this moment, they sense their need of that. Help them simply, Lord, to say, ask you to forgive their sins, to invite you into their lives, and to say, I give you my life. I want to cooperate with you. I can't change everything, but Lord, you accept me just as I come, because your word said you would. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer in your heart, I want to encourage you to join in and participate in our communion time today. Perhaps you are a believer, and yet we are not immune from the circumstances and the trials and tribulations of life. For no matter what you're facing today, would you come and say, Lord, I just need a fresh sense of your peace. I need to realize it's there. I just need to experience to release what you have already given me. We have a song that we are going to sing now. You may not know it. But I just trust that you will listen to the words. That you will sing it if you know it. Or just continue to meditate and be prepared to celebrate the Lord's Supper in just a moment. Let's worship along. i
spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before i took a breath you breathed your life in me so so kind to me oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of god oh he chases me down fights till i'm found leaves the 99 i couldn't earn it i don't deserve it still you give yourself What a wonderful song describing the reckless, overwhelming love of God, describing how Jesus came and gave his all. He gave his life as a sacrifice for you and me. We have a lot to be thankful and to celebrate today. In our understanding of scriptures, communion is open to all who are believers, who are in right relationship with God and with one another. And if that describes you, I would encourage you to participate. If by chance that doesn't describe you, even take a quick moment now or sometime today to get in right relationship with God. Reach out to a friend who is a believer and say, how do I do it? Or if by chance there's someone you're not right in relationship, covenant before God that you will make things right and follow through and offer an apology. Say, I'm sorry, whatever it needs for you to do to do your part. 
Paul reads in the scriptures. And we're going to read the scriptures collectively, have a prayer of blessing upon the emblems, and then in unity and in unity participate. Paul writes, For I have received from the Lord that also which I pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, the new testament in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you declare, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man or woman examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged or convicted by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. And Father, we pause and say thank you for your sacrifice. We pray your blessing on these emblems today. Lord, as we declare your death and resurrection, as we remember that you came and died and rose again, and as we remember that you are coming once again, we just invite you to minister to us, to answer our prayers. May we, in a very real way, sense your presence. Lord, you're here, we know it. But may that presence come alive and afresh in our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take the bread? Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we partake? Would you take the cup? Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do it. Drink it in remembrance of me. To remembrance of Jesus. We are reminded of all the covenant, all the promises God has made. And he will keep them. We have a lot to give thanks and praise for. We have a lot to look, look forward to. Remember, Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our peace. Next week, we will see that Jesus is our joy. The Lord bless you. Have a great day. Enjoy this season and be a blessing to others. Now may your peace this week be Jesus Christ, guarding your soul in peace, filling your spirit with wholeness of shalom, and ruling as the Prince of Peace in your life. Amen.